on today's show, I'm breaking down the five burning questions the Rangers have to answer in 2024, including how good are Wyatt Langford and Evan Carter, and why Max Scherzer might be the key to the Rangers winning the AL West. All that and more on this episode of Locked On Rangers. Let's get into it. You are Locked On Rangers, your daily Texas Rangers podcast, part of the Locked On Podcast Network, your team every day. You are locked onto the World Series champion Texas Rangers. I'm Bryce Patrick, a cripplingly addicted Texas Rangers fan, covering this team for 11 seasons, including all six as the founder and host of this podcast. Thank you all so much for making Locked On Rangers your first listen every single day. If you're not already, you can follow me on Twitter at Bryce Patrick. You can follow the show at Locked On Rangers. Hit subscribe on your favorite podcasting platform and on YouTube, where the best way you can help grow the show is to comment nearly any single thing below. Now, before we get into the five burning questions the Rangers have to answer this year, this episode is brought to you by PrizePix, the easiest and most exciting way to play daily fantasy sports. Go to prizepix.com slash LockedOnMLB and use code, all lowercase, LockedOnMLB for a first deposit match up to $100. Now, we are almost here. Today is Tuesday, March 26th, and we are just two days, two days away from opening day where the Rangers will unveil their banner as the reigning World Series champs. And you may think, okay, well, five burning questions sounds like a lot, but you know, it's, it's, it's a method to talk about the five things that I am most uncertain about this team. What I'm not uncertain about is that this team is the reigning World Series champs. This team is poised to make a playoff spot to be very, very darn good this year. But the range of outcomes for this season includes missing out on the playoffs, going about 500, I think is the the floor of this team, or winning 95 plus games, maybe even 100 games, winning the World Series, going back to back and just establishing a dynasty. The range of outcomes this year is massive. And these five questions are what the Rangers are going to have to answer to figure out where they land on those range of outcomes. Now, the number one question the Rangers have to answer this year, or it'll actually be over the the course of a couple years, but specifically this year, how good are Evan Carter and Wyatt Langford? I want to start with Wyatt Langford specifically because we haven't seen him in the big leagues just yet, but we will. He will be there on opening day. The Rangers confirmed that on Friday, Bruce Bochy called Wyatt Langford into his office and there was no cute, fun, you know, playful moment of, oh, are you going to get called up? Or oh, you, is this, is this, there, there was no pull in his leg because everybody and their mother knew basically from the get-go, the spring training that Wyatt Langford was making this team. And Wyatt Langford is, is probably the reason the Rangers didn't bring back Mitch Garver to DH, even though they definitely could have done the same deal that Seattle offered him. But they knew they've got this kid, Wyatt Langford, who they said, not only did they expect him to win a job out of camp, they just knew. They just knew with this kid. They knew how special he was when they drafted him number four overall last year, but they didn't really know until he got into their system, until he destroyed every minor league pitcher that he saw along the way for two months, made it all the way up to AAA, just months after being drafted. I mean, a year ago, he was still playing at Florida, hadn't yet made the College World Series where he would hit an absolutely massive tater, then get drafted number four overall, and then just absolutely light up everything in his path along the way through the minor leagues to the point where the Rangers really considered calling him up down the stretch. And even in the World Series, when Adolis Garcia got hurt after game three, they thought, mm, yeah, it's it's, it's kind of crazy to call up. It would be kind of crazy to call up this kid who we drafted just a few months ago to make his Major League debut in the World Series Game 4, and they had decided against it, but it was strongly under consideration. This guy is not just a good hitter, he is a great athlete, and his potential is, is not just to be a good rookie, not just to be the best rookie, but to be absolutely exceptional. Exceptional is the level that this guy is capable of getting to. Mike Maddox called him the best player in camp for the Rangers earlier this spring training. Now, that was before Corey Seager was there, and Corey Seager is probably one of the one to three to five best players in the world. And I don't think he's going to be better than Corey Seager his first year. But other than that, I don't see another player on this team that he couldn't be better than. Probably not, but couldn't be better than. 
So the range of outcomes for this kid is I, I don't see him being a bad hitter at all. I don't see a scenario where he is a bad hitter. There is a scenario where he is the second best hitter on this team come the end of the season or you know come the beginning of the season. In camp, he's looked like the Rangers' best hitter. He's looked absolutely exceptional. Now, granted, Corey Seager wasn't there, and Seager, I think, is the best hitter on the planet. But Wyatt Langford, while I don't think he's going to you know, put up you know, Ronald Acuna Jr. season last year or you know an offensive season like Shohei Otani, but this is a guy who is an all-star caliber hitter who I think is probably going to be an all-star this year, and I think the ceiling with this kid is absolutely insane. There's a reason he's getting comparisons to Mike Trout, not just because he's built like a, a stack of bricks, because the guy can hit everything. He adjusts so incredibly fast, and he is so exceptionally athletic. I mean, to the point where he's so confident in his hitting ability that, you know, when pitcher throws him a pitch that he likes, he's, he's smiling from ear to ear in the box saying, thank you. Thank you for this gift of a terrible pitch that I'm going to absolutely destroy. Or maybe it's even a very good pitch that I'm going to absolutely destroy because he is so confident in himself. He knows how good he is. And when the Rangers told him that he was making his, his big league debut on opening day, he didn't flinch. He didn't you know, react emotionally. He just said, yeah, that's about what's going to happen. You hit nearly 400 for the spring, hit six home runs, hit 20 RBIs, and just absolutely go nuclear as the Rangers' best hitter this spring training. The ceiling is exceptional for this kid. And I think he can be a very good defensive out, outfielder eventually. That was the one thing that the Rangers kept you know, leaning back on of, oh, well, we don't know if his defense is going to be that great. It didn't matter. It didn't matter if you're stifling his defensive ceiling for the future. He's probably going to end up in left field because right now you got two guys that are ahead of him defensively in the corners in the OD Tavares in center in Evan Carter in left and in Oles Garcia in right. So he'll, he'll shuffle in there every once in a while, give those guys a, a half day off and, and keep the outfield fresh, which I think will be good for Adoles Garcia long-term. And same for Leoti and for Evan Carter, because the wear and tear of playing a full season and then playing a month into October, even November, that does, that does a lot of damage to the body. So giving those half days off more often will be good. But the ceiling for this kid is, is one of the best players in baseball. And that's insane. The Rangers had one year of draft lottery luck where they went from the seventh pick to the fourth pick. Three teams saw this kid and thought, mm, I don't know, I want to I want to take the pitcher that throws 100 miles an hour and has a nasty slider. Okay, fine. And I want to take the, the most famous hitter, the guy who's been a very famous hitter, and I feel very good about his floor in Dylan Cruz ahead of him. Oh, okay. And then the Tigers wanted to take a high school kid who might be very good. Good on them. Thank you to all three of those teams for passing and giving the Rangers the best year in their franchise history. Not only did they win the World Series, they might have gotten a guy who is going to dominate Major League Baseball for years and years to come. And it's not just the questions about Wyatt Langford that the Rangers have to answer. I think Langford, he's projected right now by Fangraph to hit, you know, playing 138 games this year, nearly 600 plate appearances, hit around in the 260s on base, just shy of you know 340 in, in OPS, north of 800, be about a two and a half WAR player, and I think that's fine. But I I think that's a pretty conservative estimate for how good I think Wyatt Langford can be this year, and I think there are a lot of conservative estimates about. Evan Carter and how good he can be. There's more data on Evan Carter because he's been playing in the minor leagues for longer and he got a little bit of a stint in the big leagues where he just went off and earned that little savior nickname and looked absolutely incredible. I think the range of outcomes for both these kids is anywhere from about a two and a half war season to maybe a five win season for both of them for uh, be a five war player. I think either of these guys could do that this year over the course of a full season. I think that there are a wider range of outcomes for Evan Carter because his defensive floor is, is so high. He's going to be a very good defender in left field. He's going to be a pretty darn good defender in center field. He's already incredibly fast. He's going to walk a lot. Both these guys are going to walk a lot. But Evan Carter, if he hits 10 to 15 home runs, he's probably a pretty good player. If he hits 15, 20, 25 home runs, which I think is possible, then he's also an absolute star. And the Rangers have two franchise cornerstones at 21 and 22, manning their outfield for the next six seasons to come. 
And this starts to look like a very, very promising dynasty. They're not going to figure out exactly who these two guys are in year one, but them breaking onto the scene and putting up anywhere near the kind of performance like Evan Carter did for that two-month stretch down the home stretch and through the World Series, oh boy, look out for these Texas Rangers in 2024. Coming up, we're going to talk about Max Scherzer being the difference between the Rangers finishing maybe out of the playoffs and going to a 95-win pace and maybe taking that AOS crown from the Astros. Right after this word from our sponsors. This episode is brought to you by Prize Picks. You can now win up to 100 times your money on Prize Picks with as little as four correct picks. You can turn $10 into $1,000 with NBA, NHL, and college basketball entries today on Prize Picks, America's number one fantasy sports app. Conference tournaments have come and gone, and we are here to the Sweet 16. Turn that hoops knowledge into cash for yourself. Prize Picks is so simple to play. You can make your picks and submit your entry in less than 60 seconds. Quick withdrawals, easy gameplay, and an enormous selection of players and stat types are what make Prize Picks the number one daily fantasy sports app. Price Picks now offers Apple Pay with quick and easy deposits into your account this basketball season. So download the app today and use code LOCKEDONMLB for a first deposit match up to $100. Again, download that Price Picks app today. Use code LOCKEDONMLB for a first deposit match up to $100. Price Picks. Pick more, pick less. It's that easy. Shout out to the Everydayers for making Locked On Rangers your first listen every single day. On tomorrow's show, I'll be back and talk about my five bold predictions for the Rangers in 2024. Now, my number two question, burning question, the Rangers have to answer this year, is what can they get from Max Scherzer? Now, the game, the name of the game this season for the Rangers is to just hold on for dear life in the first half while they wait for these starting pitching reinforcements to get back. Keep hitting, keep themselves in it. Stay around 500 while you wait on the trio of Max Scherzer, Tyler Malley, and Jacob deGrom to get healthy and rejoin this team. Because when at full strength, if the Rangers do get to full strength in their starting pitching staff, if they just get to the playoffs, the Rangers have shown that being a wild card team does not phase them. Having to go on the road in the playoffs, well, they actually kind of like that. Going 11-0, a record 11-0 in route to their first ever World Series championship. And so if you stay afloat with the first half rotation being what it is, which I think is more than fine, <clears throat> then once those reinforcements come back in Scherzer, Malley, and DeGrom in that order, then you're in a good position. Now, if the Rangers want to not just stay afloat, not just, you know, be okay and go from, eh, We'll be a wild card team and we'll sneak in and and hopefully we we don't, you know, poop the bed in a, a short wild card series and then again go on another deep run. Then I think the key to them winning the AL West, which is gonna be a very tight race this year, is Max Scherzer. Now, there are a lot of reasons for pessimism on Max Scherzer. He's old. He's pitched a lot. He has got a lot of innings under his belt. In fact, it is 2,834 and two-thirds career major league innings in 16 seasons. He hasn't pitched more than 160 innings since 2021 when he did that splitting time between the Dodgers and the Nationals. He only pitched 145 and a third innings in 2022. And last year, only 152 and two-thirds innings between the Mets and the Rangers. And he's coming off of a back surgery. And back surgeries are hard to come back from. But let's also look at the rest of this back of this guy's baseball card. This is a three-time Cy Young winner, an eight-time All-Star, a two-time World Series champ, 75 career baseball reference war, a 318 career ERA, and over 3,300 strikeouts. 3,367, if you want to be specific, and I, I very much do. If someone's going to come back from a back surgery and is age 39, turning 40 in, in June, excuse me, July 27th season, then why is it not going to be Max Scherzer? This guy was exceptional with Rangers down the stretch, a 320 ERA in 45 innings with the Rangers in the regular season. Obviously, when he came back, he was coming back hurt. He came back much sooner from injury from that terrorist major injury than anyone expected. 
when he went down in that game in Toronto, everyone thought, okay, well, this is a good run. It's a good try, and the season's over, and we're never going to see Max Scherzer again until next year. That wasn't the case. Pitched in several games and just ended up not quite being his full self because, again, he was pitching hurt in the ALCS in the World Series. Still was acceptable in that World Series start, but left early with that back injury that ended up needing surgery, and he's projected to come back in June at this point. But what if he came back a little earlier? What if the Rangers got more innings out of him than they expected? What if, hear me out, what if half a season of being mediocre with the Mets on a non-competitive team in 2023 didn't mean that this guy was washed? What if this guy still has another gear left in there? Now, to be clear, the Rangers don't need him to go back to his Cy Young caliber self. Those days are probably gone. Probably. Not entirely sure. Not entirely willing to rule that possibility out. But this guy finished third in Cy Young as recently as 2021. Third in Cy Young. Not that long ago. And in 2022, with the Mets, that season where he pitched under 150 innings, but came back mid-season and looked exceptional, he had a 2.29 ERA back in 2022. That's two years removed. If somebody's going to come back and be absolutely elite, sensational, pitcher of a generation, why would it not be Max Scherzer? Now, the Rangers don't need him to be that elite version of himself, but if he is, and he comes back, say June 1st, say he doesn't come back in May, which the Rangers don't really need him to. The month of May is is not going to be their most difficult month. They've got a lot of games early on against the Nationals, Royals, A's, Rockies, Guardians, Angels, not really worried about the month of May. But in June, especially around mid-June, say he comes back June 10th. That's that's about the middle of June. That's an off day for the Rangers. And starting after that, June 11th through the 13th, the Rangers have a road series against the Dodgers. Three games there, three games in Seattle, then three games against the Mets, and they end the month of June with four games on the road against the Orioles. That is a difficult stretch. Now, in between the the Mariners and Orioles series, there's some games against the Mets, Royals, and Brewers, who I don't think will be that great this year, but that'll be about the time where the Rangers are starting to feel the effects of, of you know, the season, of being World Series champs, and of most of their starting staff, four out of five. Well, actually, five out of five, because Lorenzen also pitched into the NLCS and pitched a whole lot of innings last year. That's when the wear and tear will start to show, and and the Rangers might suffer an injury or two in the starting rotation. And they could really use Max Scherzer back right around then. And if they're getting a decent number of innings from Scherzer, say right now he's projected for 111 innings by Fangraphs, 19 starts. Baseball reference is much more optimistic, projects 151 innings. If they get 151 innings from Max Scherzer, even if it's you know down the stretch with the Rangers last year version of Scherzer, or even a little bit of the version that we saw with the Mets that was not great, but still pretty good. I think that clearly takes this team from what some people are expecting, 85-ish wins, definitely up into the 90, 92, 95-win territory. And if he's the good version of Max Scherzer, I mean, holy crap, look out for this team. Having Max Scherzer and, and Nathan Eovaldi as your number one and two for most of the season, and then you push down Gray to the number three role, and then your four or five is some combination of Heaney, Dunning, and um, Lorenzen. That is a really darn good team. And then, not to mention, whenever you get back Mally, if Mally comes back this season, I haven't heard much about Mally's recovery. They're expecting July. Um, we'll see what he looks like when he comes back, when he comes back. And, and DeGrom is still very much a question mark at this point. But good Lord, still thinking about how incredibly insane this this playoff rotation would be if fully healthy of DeGrom, Scherzer, Eovaldi as your three, and then whoever the heck else as your number four with this lineup. Good God, look out for this team. Max Scherzer is a huge X factor for this team who, it's really just a cherry on top. The Rangers just need competent starting innings. And, and I think Max Scherzer's very baseline is competency to above average and the ceiling is absolutely sky high with him now there's a lot of reasons to believe that he won't do it but 
if you're going to bet on somebody in their age 39 season to come back from back surgery and be pretty darn good, then why wouldn't it be one of the best pitchers of a generation in Max Scherzer? Coming up, we can get to the last three questions the Rangers need to answer this year in order to repeat as champs. Right after this word from our sponsors. This episode is brought to you by FanDuel. Say goodbye to busted brackets because FanDuel lets you bet on every game of the tourney. Whether you're betting on a big upset or one seed, it is time to go dancing on America's number one sportsbook. Right now, new customers get $200 in bonus bets if your first $5 bet wins. That's $200 to use on point spreads, money lines. You can even pick who's going to win it all. You know who's not going to win it all? Anybody who I picked in my bracket. Might be the worst bracket I have ever made in the history of my March Madness bracket, but bracket making but FanDuel still lets you get in on the action no matter how busted your bracket is we are in the sweet 16 and I'm sure most of your brackets are just as busted as mine if not more maybe hopefully for your sake a little bit less but get in on the action go to FanDuel.com slash locked on bet on college hoops until they cut down the nets shout out to the everyday for making locked on Rangers your first listen every single day on Thursday's show which will be opening day. We're talking about why this Ranger season shows this is about to be the start of a dynasty for your Texas Rangers. Now, question number three, burning question number three. How much better is this bullpen than last year? Last year, the bullpen, I literally ran out of words. I started looking up words in different languages, all kinds, maybe even fake languages. I think it got to the point where I was just so flummoxed and frustrated and over whatever under the moon for this bullpen it was just an absolute travesty all season long until the playoffs where everything became magically right for a one-month stretch that was all the Rangers needed of Leclerc and Spores and even Chapman points figuring things out for that World Series run now how much better is this bullpen than last year well it it, it sure as shoot can't be any worse it just can't. A team that had the worst save percentage in Major League Baseball, not only making the playoffs, but you know, being a tiebreaker away from winning the AL West from, at that point, the reigning World Series champs. A little bit better bullpen makes this team so much better. The starting rotation has its question marks, but the offense is absolutely sensational. And even a mediocre bullpen, which I think the Rangers have at least a mediocre bullpen this year. There are four guys that I feel very confident in having solid seasons and high leverage of LeClerc, of Spores, and the new guys, Yates and David Robertson. Kirby Yates and David Robertson both have a lot of experience, and I feel I feel confident with them back there. I feel less concerned that uh, you know they're going to pull a Will Smith in the second half and just you know lay an egg. Smith was phenomenal for the first half. He kept that Rangers bullpen alive when it was just the most on fumes bullpen I've ever seen. And I think this bullpen is going to be much better this year because it, it, it just, it literally cannot get any worse. The number four question the Rangers have to answer this year is, is there another level to the starting rotation? The first half starting rotation, I should specify. Because the first half rotation goes like this. Nate Eovaldi, John Gray, Dane Dunning, Andrew Heaney, and of course, the new guy, Michael Lorenzen. And last year, that rotation was, it was fine. It was fine. It was fine. Dane Dunning was phenomenal for the first half of the season. Came back to came back down to earth a little bit in the second half, and I think that version of Dunning, I mean his his sinker was one of the best pitchers in one of the best pitches in baseball last year. He has so far scrapped the the changeup that was not very good against lefties, and he is now using a forkball, a modified splitter, which I think will be very good and help him be better against lefties because he's going to face some lefties. For John Gray, he is the most hot and cold starting pitcher I've seen in a while. And, you know, in the first half, he was fantastic. Down the stretch, not so much. Out of the bullpen in the World Series, absolutely phenomenal. And with Heaney, he was fine as your number five guy. And, and we've seen Lorenzen last year was an all-star last year with Detroit, threw a no-hitter with Philadelphia. And then after working a massive innings limit, <clears throat> you know, more innings than he had thrown before in his career, he really hit a wall and just wasn't the same version of himself. He is pitching angry with a chip on his shoulder because it took him until you know about a week before the regular season started to get a deal. I think he'll be a solid addition to this crew. And with Cody Bradford as the long man in the pen, I think this rotation, there, there's something else there. He's definitely got more upside than he showed last year. I'm more a believer that 
Dane Dunning can repeat what he did last year, which is a mid threes ERA. I think John Gray's definitely got something else in there. And, you know, even if they don't, even if they just are what they are, I think this first half rotation is more than enough to keep this team afloat while they wait for Scherzer and Malley and DeGrom to come back. Now, the last question these Rangers have to answer, burning question number five <clears throat> for your Texas Rangers in 2024, is, is there some regression from the all-star hitters? Now, I said this on yesterday's show as my key to these Rangers repeating as World Series champs is uh, they have got to have numbers, hitters number seven through nine, the bottom third of this order. They've got to still be good. That's what made this team exceptional, unbeatable in the first half, and when things came to shove, when push came to shove in the playoffs, that's what made this team you know, go on this run and be able to, you know, be World Series champs. It's it's not because their pitching was was unbelievable or world beating. It, it's because the offense was just incredibly deep and talented. Now the three guys that I'm mainly talking about, the All Star level hitters, th- this is the the next, I guess the mid mid three. Maybe it's the middle of this rotation or this batting order, depending on how things stack up. I have no questions about Corey Seager being in- sensational. I have no questions about Marcus Simeon. He he is who he is, and I think there's still even a little bit higher offensive level production than he produced last year. And <clears throat> I'm not questioning Adoles Garcia at this point. He's been about a four-win player for the last three years, and he took it to another level last year. And if he sustains that this year, he's going to be sensational. But that next, that tier of the next three, outside of Carter and Langford, which I already talked about, that that tier is Josh Young. Uh, Jonah Heim and Nathaniel Lowe. Now, the two all-stars of that group, they both had sensational first halves. Absolutely sensational. Josh Young, 835 OPS in the first half. Second half, all the way down to 638. Jonah Heim in the first half, an 812 OPS. 656 in the second half. The wear and tear on those guys was legitimate. They both suffered major injuries and, and came back probably a little sooner than they were ready for, and, and that's why their second-half numbers were, were down so far. And the next guy in that group, Daniel Lowe, he had a quietly sensational month of July. I didn't realize he had an OPS over 1,000 for the month of July. But outside of that, the, I mean, the rest of his season, especially in September and October, like, it just got rough for him. A 539 OPS in a 29 regular season games in September slash October 1st. Just not great for him down the stretch. And... In 2022, he was the Rangers' second best hitter, maybe even their best hitter. And I think that's more the level of Nathaniel Lowe offense we're hoping for, the Rangers are hoping for, and and Lowe himself is hoping for. If Jonah Heim is your number eight hitter and he's got an OPS in the 800s, if it's, you know, 15, 20% above league average, and he's an exceptional defensive catcher, which we, we all know, he's not going to lose his, his starting job as the Rangers' starting catcher unless... Andrew Kisner suddenly becomes like Barry Bonds or something, which I don't think any of us really <laughs> see happening. But Jonah Heim has another level to get to. And I think of these three, maybe Lowe's offensive ceiling is the highest, but I'm I'm more a believer in Josh Young's offensive ceiling. The things that he needs to change are just get that walk rate up just a little bit, cut that walk that strikeout rate just a little bit, because the strikeout rate and the walk rate, both in the bottom 16% of baseball last year. But everything else, hitting for power, hitting for average is better than people expected it from last year. And there's a defensive floor from, well, actually all three of these guys, and, and two of them you couldn't really expect that last year. In Young and Low, their defense was considered you know subpar to suspect to terrible. And they were both gold glove caliber last year. And well, we all know Jonah Heim's defense is, is sensational, and, and he did end up winning a gold glove, and so did Nathaniel Lowe. But if these guys can be more of the hitters that we're expecting, them, if Josh Young can avoid a sophomore slump and take a sophomore surge, a thing that I just made up, and I feel very, very good about that term off the top of my head, if those guys can be the level of hitter they were in the first half, and, and Lowe can be, well, second, not not even second half Nathaniel Lowe of 2022, because that was insane. If he can get there again, then who boy, look out for the rest of this offense, especially, you know, whatever comes of, of Langford and Carter's offense. But that is what will take this team from, you know, fighting to stay alive in that first half to legitimate dominant AL West Kings. 
because there's that level in there for all of these guys. Lowe took that big step defensively last year, and I think that the stuff with his mother you know, undergoing cancer treatments, that's that's got away on it. There's no way that didn't affect how he was performing in the second half, and I, I can't imagine what that was like going through it. And with Jonah Heim, just the general wear and tear of being an everyday catcher and not having as many off days, and, and not to mention the wrist inju- injury that, that took him out for quite a bit of time in the second half. And, and Josh Young, if he just you know stays healthy and, and stops getting these random injuries just that just keep piling up for Young, of just getting hit in the thumb with a line drive of 110 or whatever miles an hour, maybe it was 109 off the bat that broke his thumb and make him, made him miss six weeks down the stretch, or the calf injury that it looks like he's back from because he was out there playing third base in the Rangers' final game in Arizona, or Nathaniel Lowe, if he can just get back into that reaching for the power, the offense, the you know batted ball, the batting average and, and on base, they're going to be there for Nathaniel Lowe. The, the quality at bats are going to be there for Nathaniel Lowe. But if he can tap into that just light tower power, all these guys have significant power. I mean, the depth of this Rangers lineup was what propelled them to the World Series and made them one of the best teams in baseball for the majority of last season. And I don't think it was a fluke. I don't think that what the Rangers offense did last year of any of these hitters. I, I don't think there's any reason to believe they couldn't do it again. Not to mention if they get some offense from Leo Tavares, I think that's just the cherry on top of your number nine hitter who in the first half of last year had an eight twelve OPS with 10 home runs. Now second half was a six forty two OPS and the playoffs were, were not <laughs> Leo's offensive friend, but this group of three in low young and Heim, if they can be all-star caliber, the sky is limit for this team, not just for 2024, but for years and years to come. And after seeing what they've done throughout their careers, the kind of hitters they are and the kind of team and hitting coaching staff that this team has, I have all the confidence in the world that any questions about these three being absolute studs will be answered in 2024. That's going to do it for today's show. Thank you all so much for listening and subscribing. And until next time, don't forget to enjoy World Series champion Texas Rangers baseball.